This week we delve into the plotter versus pantser dichotomy of fiction writing with Tiffany DiBartolo, author of the novel Sorrow. For me, plotting a story takes the fun out of the discovery of the writing journey. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley. Caroline's not with us today, but we do have a really interesting book. It's um, it's a little different, I think, than a lot of the books that we do. Uh, so we'll get into that here in a minute. Uh, our our guest today is Tiffany De Bartolo. Am I saying that right? Pretty close. The <laughs> Bartolo is usually the way most people say it. <laughs> Bartolo. Okay, Tiffany Bartolo, and Tiffany grew up in Youngstown, Ohio. And then she went to study philosophy at UC Berkeley. She became a writer and founded a record label. Sorrow is her most recent novel. Her previous works include God Shaped Hole in 2002, How to Kill a Rock Star in 2005, and the graphic novel Grace based on the Jeff Buckley story in 2019, and the film Dream for an Insomniac in 1996, which she wrote and directed. And she's the founder and chief executive super goddess of Bright Antenna Records, whose roster (laughs) includes the Wombat, Sports Team, Wilderado, Prep, and more. And she also co-founded the Shine Maker Foundation, a charity organization (laughs) dedicated to making the world a better place. And occasionally she sleeps. And (laughs) And she's a faculty member of the Jackson Hole Writers Conference where she teaches writing every June in her spare time. She's a runner, hiker, yogi, traveler, cook, poet, artist, and feminist living in Mill Valley, California, with her husband, Scott Shoemaker, and her two Irish wolfhounds. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Tiffany. I don't know how you have time to even talk to me. (laughs) Well, you just made me sound so much busier than I actually am, especially in the last few months. <laughs> oh, I bet. How how has uh, COVID affected your life? Um, well, you know, it's been really hard on the music business, as you can imagine. You know, live the live concert business has come to a halt. So that's been really difficult for a lot of the bands that I work with. Um, but uh, the book business, I think, is a little bit better because I don't know about you, but I've been reading three times as many books as I normally have time to read, um, being that I'm, I've literally been home since March. So, um, so that's, that I hope is a good thing that people are reading more. I think it is. And yes, you're right. I think people are reading more. Now, Mill Valley is home. It's also the setting Mm -hmm. for sorrow and it's a pretty beautiful place to be quarantined. I must say, you know, I can't (laughs) tell you how many times over the last seven months, I have said that um, because I used to live in New York City for a brief period and um, having miles and miles of redwoods and trails um, within 10 minute walk of my back door has been the saving grace for um, being being locked up. So, um, yeah, it's it's been such a gift to be here. I I was in Mill Valley once. Um, Mm -hmm. It was. Right before 9-11, it was Labor Day oh, weekend wow. of 2001, and my I was there with my friend Paul, and we both were born in Northern California. Mm. Neither of us had been back there um, to much extent. I had been to San Francisco once, but and, but other than that, not in the air, not to where we were born since we left at like the age of three for me and might have even been younger for him. I was born in um, Grass Valley. Oh, it's so beautiful. (laughs) Yeah, and he was born on an Air Force base. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but up there in in that area near Sacramento. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, so we we spent a few few days in Mill Valley. We went to Muir Woods. We, We went up Mount Tam. So it was really fun to to see those areas in your book. Oh, cool. I'm glad. How did you end up in Mill Valley? Um, well, like you said earlier, I went to um, college in at UC Berkeley, um, which is where I met my husband. And he 
and we ended up moving to Boulder because he went to grad school there after after college. Um, and then we moved back to Southern California when I was working in the film business for a while. And then we moved to New York for a while. And we, but when we started the record label, one of our partners was here in the Bay Area, and so we decided to move back here. And um, we didn't want to move back to Berkeley just because that felt like going back to college. So um, so we decided on the the North Bay. And, you know, we like to play outside a lot, so it's a perfect place to be if you like to hike and bike and do all that kind of stuff. For sure. And the weather's pretty good year-round, too. Yes. Yeah. So I live in Fairfield, Iowa, and I'm my home is right on a trailhead, basically. And this trail goes the entire way around the town. It's 18 miles in total, which I would never actually hike. But I did <laughs> bike it a few weeks ago for the first time. By far the furthest I've ever ridden in my life. I'm um, almost, well, by some definitions, considered a senior. but uh, <laughs> And that's further than I've ever ridden at one time. And it and it's very hilly. And um, it was wow, pretty... Wow, that's amazing. I, I know, I know. But, I, you know, I, a friend and I, we wanted to do it. And we set out and we did. I even had a flat tire and had to, like, hitch a ride into town to get the tire fixed wow. and then go back out and finish it and finish the job. So anyway, um, and the, but our trail system is being used, getting a lot more use, I think, than usual. A lot of people are taking advantage of it. But now winter's coming. Oh, yeah. See, that's the other thing that I'm so grateful for is not, um, you know, I have so many friends who live in New York City who are just like, what are we going to do when winter gets here? Yeah. Back, you know, stuck in their tiny little apartments with no light yeah that's why i'm heading south <laughs> I'm, I'm, i also have a home in austin which is where my grandkids are and so i'm gonna oh nice. I'm gonna go spend some time down there yeah Austin's a great city it is and i'm right on the trail there too i have a condo that's oh, perfect. right by the river and um the lady the ladybird lake trail and yeah so it is very good to have that. Have you always been drawn to the Redwoods or did, is this something that kind of came about from writing the book? Well, it's interesting because obviously I live here and I see the Redwoods every day and I always appreciated them. But until I started delving into who Joe was, um, and for anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about, Joe is the narrator of Sorrow. Um, I, and as I started to get to know him, when I began the book, um, and, and I sort of clued into what was meaningful to him. And one of those things became the Redwoods. Um, and so I started doing a lot of research on them and now I'm just obsessed with them because they're pretty magical. Um, they're, they're kind of like magical creatures. I know they're, they're plants, but they, they are really living creatures that provide the world so many services and so I'm kind of in awe of them now and I'm a big fan I literally walk through the trails now touching them and talking to them and thanking them and saying hello people must think I'm crazy and do you name them like Joe um, I haven't done any naming except for the ones that I picked out that Joe named but um, <laughs> it's not a bad idea yeah now some of them it seemed like have names that are they generally are known by yes well yeah. that is true too the 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 ones that are sort of huge or um notable for some reason or another are named mm -hmm. so is it true that they can live 2000 years yes it is true and what do they end up dying of old age or what happens <laughs> Generally, yes, um, and, or but more often than not, it's humans that destroy them. Um, but the, the largest one is in Northern California, and it really is as tall as the Empire State Building. Wow. wow. I mean, it's crazy. So, and there are ecosystems in the tops of these trees that people don't, that, that scientists don't even know what's up there because there's no way to get to them. Seriously? You, know, you can't <laughs> climb. A, yeah, you can't climb a 380 foot tree. There are no ladders that will like lift you that high. So, um, you know, 
very few people have ever been um, to the top of a canopy of a redwood tree. Oh my gosh, I never thought about that. I bet, I bet right? people send... Right? I know, me too. How about drones? <laughs> Can they send drones up there to check it out? They, I, I bet that's what they're doing now. Yeah, I bet they are too. So, Tiffany, starting a record label is kind of um, an unusual thing to do. Can you tell us the yeah. story behind that? <laughs> well, it was a really stupid thing to do if you really <laughs> want to know the truth, because we did it pretty much around the time that people stopped buying music. <laughs> oh. um, but, <laughs> um, but I grew up a really, really passionate music fan. Um, I grew up in a small town in Ohio where there was really nothing to do. If you didn't like high school football, which I did not, um, there was nothing to do there except read and listen to music for me. So um, a lot of where my big influences came were, were, you know, authors and also musicians. So my love of music sort of um, was always something that I wanted to do something with. But then I was, I was on a vacation once with a couple friends and one of my friends who was a music producer had had about three bottles of wine and we were sitting around talking about um, just how crappy the music is on the radio. And he said, you know what we should do? We should start a record label. And I was like, yeah, that sounds fun, thinking it would be something I could do on the side, um, sort of in my spare time. But lo and behold, it's anyone who's ever started a business knows that it takes over your life and is the reason why I didn't publish a novel for over 10 years, because I was just um, so busy getting that off the ground. But eventually I sort of learned how to um, switch from left brain to right brain in a, in a constructive way so that I could do both. So Sorrow is your fourth published novel? Correct. Okay. Yeah, it's my, it's my third um, sort of standard novel. The, the last book I published, I just wrote the text to a graphic novel that someone else had drawn. Okay. <laughs> drawn. drawn. That's not a word. <laughs> drawn. <laughs> Yeah, so someone else, uh, there was an artist that drew it, and I wrote the um, text to it, so it was not a traditional novel. Okay. And what genre would you call this? What what? What, what genre would you call sorrow? Is it... Um... Um, you know, I call it general literary fiction. Um, it's funny because a lot of people, because I write a lot about love, but I don't write romance. And some people want to throw me into the romance category, but um, to me, romance novels are about fantasy. And I write about human beings struggling with how to be human, you know, um, really multidimensional characters um, with some depth. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't throw it into a genre. And, I was going to say that it, it, in a sense, it's it's sort of a romance, but from a male perspective, which you don't see very often. Right. Yeah. And, I mean, it's a love story for sure. And why did you decide to write from the male perspective? Well, that's a good question, because originally I, I started the book in October's voice. Um, but once I started sort of realizing where how the story was going to unfold and who Joe was, I quickly realized that if we weren't standing in his shoes and looking at the world through his eyes, nobody was going to understand him and they certainly weren't going to like him. <laughs> um, so because imagine, you know, if you just see his behavior from the outside looking yes, in, it would yeah. have you would have yes. really had a lot of judgment okay about, so yeah um, let, who let's, he was. let's talk about that actually because when I started reading the book I thought all right Tiffany has some guy in her past that she's really pissed at <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and she's she's creating no this really <laughs> lame guy as the as the protagonist I mean he's a he's such a loser he may as well have it branded on his forehead <laughs> and I actually don't, you know, personally, I don't like watching shows or or reading things where people self-sabotage. 
I, I just find it kind of annoying. But somewhere around a third of the way in, I started to really like him. And you are right. If it hadn't, if I hadn't been able to see it from his point of view, I don't know that I could have made that shift. And, right. and, and by the middle, I'm really rooting for the guy. Yeah. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I see, I really do. I feel like I learned a lot about, um, because he's very different from me and I learned a lot about, um, judging people by being him essentially for the two years that I spent, you know, stepping into his shoes every morning. Um, and I, what I learned is that people do things for reasons we don't understand, but they're usually more painful and hurtful for them than it is for the people they're actually hurting. And that was an interesting lesson to learn because I think it's very easy to look at people's behavior and judge them based on how they're affecting others. But, um, you know, we're all sort of just trying to figure out how to be the best people we can be on this planet. And it's not easy. Mm. That's true. Now, October, the love interest and female protagonist, um, she has, she has some of her own issues. She does. Now, is she more like you? You know, I would say of all the female characters I've ever written, she's probably the most like me, but she's obviously a very extreme version. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I could, I could imagine. Now, she's an artist and a performance artist. So tell us a little bit about what that means. Um, well, so for her, it means she, she has this sort of philosophy that art is, that life is art. And so everything she does in, in her life, she sort of looks as, you know, this artistic ceremony of sorts, whether it's, you know, getting dressed in the morning or actually painting a, a picture or making a meal. Um, so, but she also does these exhibits where um, she attempts to live out some sort of experience either on camera or in a, in a, an art gallery or a museum and um, just sort of to show how much you can turn anything into art. Give us, can you give us some examples of some of her performance art pieces? Um, sure. Well, one of the ones that she talks about um, in the book is her first one, which she called Voodoo. And what she did was rent out a, a, a an art gallery and wrapped herself in felt and sewed it together and then allowed the visitors to the gallery um, to grab these pins and stab her as as if she were a voodoo doll. Um, and like she says in the book, she was expecting people to be gentle or refrain from using the pins at all, but they didn't. So, um, yeah, that was a fun experience for her, I'm sure. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think at some point I'd say, okay, enough. Right. Not if you're an artist. No. Not if you're an artist. It. Oh, man. <laughs> So suffer through it. How did you come up with all these the performance art concepts that um, are in the book? Because there's what half a dozen of them. Yeah, at least you know that is a really good question because there would be times where I would come back to my work that I'd done the next day. I would come back the next morning and I would be reading over what I worked on the day before, and I would literally say, "Where did I come up with that? <laughs> um, I don't know." I don't know where sometimes, you know, imagination just um, it's sort of like meditation for me sometimes when I'm writing where I just sort of click out of of conscious thought and I write and I write and I write and then I read it over and I have no idea where it came from. Wow. Uh, the other one that was so like, wow, this is cool was the birdcage. Now that was yeah, Joe, that Joe's one, concept. But yeah, yes. I loved that one too. And I loved what it ended up meaning for him, which was something interesting because I didn't actually 
plot that. It was sort of a realization I had about the same time he had it in the book of, of what that really meant. Mm. So speaking of plotting, how much of the storyline do you know before you start writing? Very little. Um, for me, plotting a story takes the fun out of the discovery of the writing journey. Um, I knew generally how this book was going to begin, and I had a general idea of the characters and sort of what they wanted, but um, I didn't know anything else. And um, it, it turned out to be pretty magical in certain spots. What I would call plot point number one which I'm sure if you read the book, you can figure out what that is. Um, uh, that was something, again, that I just stumbled upon um, as I was writing, and it turned the whole book around um, and, and really, like, made it a different story. But um, had I plotted the book, I don't think that that would have ever happened. So, okay. So are you talking about October's Boyfriend? Yes, I am. <laughs> so without, yeah, not wanting to give anything away, but so yeah. you didn't know when you're writing the first part that, that... Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Not until, not until he, not until he walked into the room and I was like, can I swear on here? Uh, uh, no, unfortunately you can't. Okay. So, uh, okay, so I, I won't say what I said, but I, I just remember walking around my house and I like ran to my husband and I was like, you won't believe what just happened in this story. Oh, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> but it All made right. perfect sense. And I was like, of course. Of well, of course. course. But, yes. <laughs> um, but I didn't, I didn't plan it. It would not be the same story without it. Absolutely. Not Absolutely. at all. Not at all. You're listening to Writer's Voices. I'm Monica Hadley. And our guest today is Tiffany De Bartolo. De Bartolo. De Bartolo. <laughs> Tiffany De Bartolo. And she's the author of <laughs> Sorrow. <laughs> okay, so talking a little bit more about how the the role of music in this book. You really seem to convey what it's like to play guitar. So do you play yourself? Nope, I have no musical ability whatsoever. Oh my. oh my. But I obviously I work with a lot of musicians, so I had a lot of help with the guitar research. Did you were you familiar with these guitars? No, but that's another thing that um was a really great gift as I was writing this book because I did have to do a lot of research and I had to talk to a lot of um guitar players I know and one in particular who has this incredible collection of guitars and just taught me so much about all of them that became, you know, these passionate, um, passionate uh, toys of Joe's, you know? So um, that was a really fun part of writing this book. Now I understand that there was a specific band whose music plays a big part in the book. That is correct. And who is the that band? and what part does it play? Well, the band is The National, and they're my third favorite band in the whole world. <laughs> um, so and, who's one uh, and two? <laughs> number one is U2. They've been my favorite band um, for 40 years, um, so they get number one spot. My second favorite band is Pearl Jam, because mm. um, they've been my second favorite band for 30 years. Um, but then the national came along and became number three. And um, I don't and they know them, so I'm going to have they're to check really it out. They're a really amazing, amazing band from, um, they're, they're actually originally from Ohio, um, but American band, mostly based in New York now. But um, they they had a song on on one of their more recent albums called Pink Rabbit. And there's a line in the song where he sings, Somebody said you disappeared in a crowd. I didn't understand then. I don't understand now. And um, something about that line, you know, I'd heard the song hundreds of times before, but one day I was listening to it and something about that line just um, conjured up this whole scene in my head about um, these two characters being at this show at the Greek theater in Berkeley and one of them just walking away. And that ended up being you know, a really pivotal scene in the book and wow. was the first scene I wrote. Um, incidentally, it 
it's not in the beginning of the book, but it was the beginning of the book for me um, when I started writing it. So you don't write start to finish. Um, I mean, I thought I was, but it's just <laughs> once I once I wrote that scene, I was like, oh, this isn't the beginning. <laughs> right, right. Not even close to the beginning. <laughs> so I went back and kind of started from scratch and and rewound, but um, but that was originally the first scene in the book. Okay, and there's also a song that you got the title from. Yes, and so there are others. Another one of their songs, which is one of my favorites, is called Sorrow. Um, but that one kind of just um, fit in into the book really well um, accidentally. You know, it wasn't like I was um, using that song as a as a jumping off point, like like the song Pink Rabbits was. Now, are there other ways that pink rabbits show up in the book? Um, you know, they're kind of mentioned here and there, um, just randomly, only to um, only as an homage to the song, really. <laughs> I, I understand there's something about one of the cocktails. That is, uh... Yes. Well, <laughs> uh, well, the, the, the song makes reference to Pink Rabbits as a cocktail. And allegedly, although I don't know if this is true, the lead singer of the band invented this cocktail that's basically strawberry milk and tequila and Kahlua. Um, which might sound disgusting, but I did try to make it, and it's not terrible. Um, so, but I didn't want to use that in the book because it just seemed like too much. Um, so I, I let Joe invent his own cocktail, which he named the Brown Recluse, which okay. is a sort of a, a a play on the Pink Rabbit. Okay, let me get. I remember reading about it. Was it chocolate milk? Yeah, so it was chocolate milk, tequila, tequila. cinnamon, and. Um, can't remember there's one other ingredient cayenne pepper i think ah that actually sounds pretty good uh, it was we we had that we made it on um release day and it was really good <laughs> <laughs> so tiffany would you like to read a section from sorrow i would love to great i'm actually going to read the first couple pages just um because that seems like a good way to start start at the very beginning off. <laughs> yeah all right. Okay, here I go. My name is Joseph Harper, and if there is one thing you should know about me, it is this. I am not a brave man. Over the course of my 37 living years, I have been called a lot of respectable things, intelligent, sensitive, even good-looking and gifted, but not brave, never brave. And now a confession, one I'm not proud of. I was recently asked to leave the Whitefish Community Library in Whitefish, Montana, due to intoxication. It wasn't even lunchtime yet, and the three shots of tequila I'd had before I got there began to hit me in an obvious and somewhat disorderly way. I am not brave, I said to no one. I have never been brave. I was alone in a warm, light-filled corner of the botany section on a leather recliner where, to my left, outside the window, the leaves of an aspen tree were announcing the steadfastness of spring. That settled me for a moment. Spring, rebirth, new beginnings. But then I noticed the aspen's eyes trained on mine with what I was certain was disappointment. Stop looking at me like that, I said to the tree, louder than what was considered polite in a library. I had the foot rest up so my feet were comfortably elevated and there was a rectangular coffee table book called Remarkable Trees of the World on my lap. I used the book as a desk for my laptop because I found that if I just set the laptop on my legs, it eventually heated up and burned my skin, even through my jeans. Mr. Harper, is everything all right? Patty, the librarian, had wandered over to check on me. She knew me by name because I had been going there for almost three years to read and write and check my email. The little guest cabin I lived in on Sid's property didn't have an internet connection. And even though Sid said I could get one, I never bothered because I didn't think I'd be staying in Montana long enough to need it. Mr. Harper, Patty said again. She was wearing her usual camouflage pants. And I said, Patty, where are your legs? But she didn't get the joke. Are you all right? I wanted to shake my head and tell her that I was most definitely not all right, but I gathered she was aware of this fact. 
that her question was largely rhetorical. She'd seen me when I was there an hour earlier, and I'd been fine then. Well, I'd been sober. We'd exchanged trite pleasantries about the weather, and I was as right as a guy like me can be, which, if right were the whole, is only a fraction. But then I opened my inbox and saw the email from the Thomas Fraser Gallery announcing October's upcoming living exhibit entitled Sorrow and the Fraction Halved. How's that? Thank you. And that was Tiffany DeBartolo reading from Sorrow. Is the Thomas Fraser Gallery a real place? It is not. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds familiar somehow. <laughs> it is not. It is a fictional gallery. <laughs> but the coffee shop that Joe goes to in Mill Valley is a real place, I understand. That is a real place. As a matter of fact, I wrote very uh, a, a considerable amount of the book in that coffee shop. What is it about writing in public that works for you? You know, I think as crazy as this sounds, it. I can really drown out distractions when I'm in a coffee shop. You know, there's so much noise around, but it's kind of, it turns into white noise. And then I can just kind of get into a flow. When I try to write at home, my dogs do not really want to give me the time of day. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I get really inspired <laughs> being in coffee shops. Plus, you know, there is coffee as well. Well, there is <laughs> the that. Helps. There is that. The coffee helps. What, what do you drink? Do you drink lattes, cappuccino? I think cappuccinos. That's what shows up in sorrow. Yeah. Um, you know, I recently just started doing bulletproof coffee. So I put butter in it oh, in the morning. I, yeah. Which sounds, it sounded so weird to me, but a friend of mine turned me on to it. And now I'm obsessed with it. It's so delicious and creamy. It's a big thing in Austin. But it's I, good. but I don't know if I've, I know I had a, like a canned bottle, a can of it in my fridge for a while, but I don't think I ever drank it and it probably wouldn't yeah, be as well, good as fresh anyway. Yeah, well, you got to make it fresh. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. you've got to put the butter in and then like blend it up <laughs> in a little magic bullet and it's really good. I just, to me, it's like, I'm already like pushing the limit on calories if I put cream in I it. I know. <laughs> I know, I know. Buttercream, you know, what's the difference? <laughs> the other thing I'll say about working in, in Equator, which was really helpful for me, is they don't have an internet connection. So anytime I was in there working, I had to actually be writing because there were no distractions. Well, that is great, but I didn't know that such a thing existed, a coffee shop know, without right? an internet connection. <laughs> Pretty much, I think they probably do that on purpose, hoping that people aren't going to sit there and work all day. But if you're a writer, it actually comes in handy. It does. Now, most writers, of course, do some research on the Internet as part of their book. Was there anything that you needed to research on the Internet? Yeah, and I did. I spent a lot of time in the library as well. Mill Valley has a beautiful, beautiful library. So on days when I would have to do a lot of research, I usually worked there. What, what kind of things, I mean, you talked about the guitars, you're researching that. What else were you researching? I mean, I did a lot of research on the trees, obviously, um, and just different areas of um, hiking in the area, um, and a lot of art stuff as well, you know, just making sure that I was, um, I was portraying the art world properly. Now, did you always think that you would become a writer? I always dreamed of becoming a writer, but to be honest, and I always did it, you know, it was something that I, I, for as long as I can remember, um, kept a journal and a diary and wrote, you know, silly poems and songs. But, um, but I, I remember growing up thinking you had to be this sort of like genius person to be a professional writer. But when I graduated from college, the first job I got, um, was a job reading scripts for a production company in Los Angeles. And, I literally read probably five to eight screenplays a day and I would have to write coverage on them and, and sort of recommend them to the, to the producer that I worked with um, or not. And when I tell you the scripts that came, that made it to my desk, nine out of 10 of them were almost unreadable. They were so terrible. 
Um, and so I think that was the point where I was like, I could actually be a professional writer if I wanted to be because <laughs> Cause I'm better people, than this. <laughs> I mean, like I could do this with my eyes closed. So that's why I kind of started as a screenwriter, because it seemed like a really, really easy um, way to get into writing as a job. But I quickly realized that Hollywood was not the place for me and and happily turned to novels. Mm. And how did you get your first novel published? Um, well, it was the hardest part was getting an agent. Like I remember sending out hundreds of query letters and this was back before the internet was all the rage. And so it was literally mailing out letters, begging people to read the first 30 pages of my new novel. And, um, uh, I'm not joking when I sent, said, say I sent out over a hundred query letters and only two agents, um, ended up saying, Oh, I'll, this sounds interesting. I'll read I'll read the first 30 pages and the first one I sent it to um, happened to love it and became my agent and is still my agent to this day. So, um, so that was the hardest part, getting, getting him on board. And then, you know, it's his job to sell the book. So um, I just sort of sat back and, and read the rejection letters that he got and kept <laughs> asking him, why are you sending me these? And he said, I remember him saying, because when I finally, finally send you the one, that tells you we sold it, it's going to mean all that much more. And he was right, it did. Oh, wow. Do you think it's easier now when, I mean, back, not only did you have to send out physical query letters, but I know sometimes you had to wait till you heard back before you could send yes. another one. Yep. And, yeah. So how have things changed? Well, I mean, it's so much easier now because people can, you know, people are reading their emails all day long so they can say, yeah, this sounds good or no, I'm not interested. But I think the other thing that's so different now is that people are so successful as self when they're as self-published authors. I mean, I have never undertaken that because it seems so daunting to have to do it all yourself. But I have some really close friends who um self-published books for years and have been so successful at it. And that was not something that was even remotely possible to be a bestseller and a self-published author back in, you know, 1999. That was just unheard of. So I think there's a lot more opportunities now for people. Now, after, for writers. You, after you published your first novel, was it easier the second time around? Um, to, to to write it or to, to, to no to publish it. it to publish it it was actually because I the um, publishing company that published my first one published um, published my second one as well but given the huge gap um, between my second and my third I had to basically start over with sorrow and um, my agent had to. Um, shop it around for quite a long time, actually. I, I would imagine your aging maybe got a little um, discouraged, but but when you didn't write again for so long. Oh yeah, he was really on my case for a long time, and and I wanted to, I just couldn't figure it out. And you know, I'm also one of these writers that, unless I'm feeling like this pull to tell a story. Um, it's kind of like something that just gnaws at me and then I have to get it out. Um, and it just, it, for 10 years, I wasn't feeling that pull. Are you writing something new now that, uh, sorrow is I, I done? I haven't, I haven't started it yet, but I can feel something marinating, um, inside of me. So I'm probably going to, I'm going to try and wait until the beginning of the year to start it just because this whole year has been so crazy. And um, as it's funny because when we went into shelter in place and it was clear that we weren't going to be going back to an office for a long time, I was imagining that I was going to like have this creative spurt and just do nothing but write. But I really had a hard time kind of focusing. So I, I decided to let myself off the hook about that and just, <laughs> Let the uh, let the year play itself out, and then January one, time to start a new book. That sounds like a good plan. Now, will your dogs make an appearance in this next book? Do you think? Um, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> since since, there, since Diego was definitely modeled um, after my 
my oldest child, Dipsy. Um, I, they may have played themselves out, but you never know. And Diego is an, is it an Irish wolfhound? Yes, that... Irish wolfhound. Okay, tell us a little bit about about that breed of dog. Um, well, they are the tallest dog breed in the world. So my dog, Dipsy, who um, is about five and a half now, he is seven feet tall on his hind legs. Oh my weighs gosh. 180 pounds. He weighs more than my husband. Wow. Um, and But they're the most gentle, incredible dogs. I mean, I grew up with various kinds of dogs, and Irish Wolfhound was my dream dog my whole life because I'd read a book about them when I was about nine or ten. Um, but I obviously couldn't get one until I had a yard big enough to um, to accommodate them. And so, um, yeah, about five and a half years ago, finally – um, we decided we could get one and we fell in love with him so much that we were like, we need another one, which of course <laughs> meant we had to get a, a van to drive them around because they're so huge. Oh my gosh. But they're really magical creatures. I mean, they're super intuitive and super gentle and just um, really, they, they bring a lot of joy to my life. Well, I've always liked big dogs. Um, oh, you would love them then. Yeah, yeah but I, I'm, that seems a little, like a little extreme, but I've had in my life, I've had Siberian Huskies and Samoys oh. and um, Norwegian Elkhound. Um, oh, they're awesome too. Yeah, and my, my son has had um, um, Rottweilers. Oh, yeah, and, they're great dogs. And uh, Dago Argentino which is oh. a very large um, pit bull relative, but a lot bigger wow. and they're white. Never and heard of that. Yeah. It's they're They're really beautiful dogs too. So yeah, I probably, I would probably like your dogs quite a bit. Yeah. They're pretty, they're super friendly too. And like walking them around town in Mill Valley, they may as well be the mayors of town. Like <laughs> my husband and I have like been places, once we were in a restaurant right in downtown Mill Valley and these people came over to us and they were like, aren't you Dipsy and Kazoo's parents? And we were just like, <laughs> they don't know our names, but they know our dogs. <laughs> That's great. That's great. That's really cute. <laughs> You're listening to Writer's Voices and our guest today is Tiffany DiBartolo, author of Sorrow. Tiffany, you describe yourself and I believe this is accurate, as a feminist. How yeah. does that um, come through in your writing? Um, you know, that's a good question because it's not something that I don't like to hit people over the head with, um, with uh, morality when I'm writing. So it's not something that I'm conscious of putting into my writing, but I do feel like as a woman who cares about the rights of other women, um, it's something that I may write about someday. Um, it, I, I guess what I'm saying is in the last four years, I've realized how much of a fem feminist I am much more so than any other time in my life. And, there's part of me that feels like there's a story inside of me that is going to um, come out that reflects that, but um, I haven't figured it out yet. Hmm. Well, how about in sorrow? In what ways, um, like you're writing from a male perspective, did your feminism inform that in some way? Um, I don't think that it informed who Joe was, um, but that it was an interesting sort of exercise to to write from a male perspective. And I think one of the things that I realized as I was doing that was that men and women aren't as different as society sort of raises us to believe that we are, because I think deep down we all want the same things, and that's really love and connection. Um, but I do think that October is a very independent woman, um, I think she stands on her own. I think she is um, a good example for what a feminist can look like. 
Well, do you feel like Joe has been impacted by society's expectations for masculinity? Yes, I do. And I think I, I, I would be hard pressed to find a man in this society who isn't, who hasn't been. Um, but I think he's, he is particularly sensitive um, to it, mainly because he experienced a lot of trauma and abandonment in his childhood. And so I think his, he, he sort of took on a lot of expectations that he sensed he wasn't going to be able to live up to. And that just added to the weight on his shoulders. You know, we find out pretty early in um, the book that Joe had lost a brother when he was mm-hmm. young and, um, and that obviously had a had a big impact on him. What made you decide to have that influence on Joe? Um, you know, again, when I'm writing, it's hard to it's hard to say why things evolve the way they do. Um, because I, as crazy as this sounds, I really do at times feel like these characters become, you know imaginary yes but real people you know to me and um and their lives kind of reveal themselves to me and I remember writing the scene um early on in the book where Joe is driving across the Richmond Bridge and um he's on his way to interview for the job he gets with October and I just wrote that scene where he talks about his dead brother and I didn't know what had happened to his brother at that point. I just suddenly realized that he had one. So Mm. that's how things unfold when I'm writing. (laughs) Um, You know, my characters tell me things and then I have to kind of follow their lead and figure it out. Do you ever have the experience where something like that comes up, but later it just doesn't seem to fit and you have to go back and rework it? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm certain that many things that I tried out many things in this book that ended up not working. I mean, originally the book was, um, I was imagining it was going to be more a story about, um, Joe and Cal and their friendship as kids. Um, but again, it just evolved into something completely different. Wow. So let's talk a little bit more about your writing process. Um, you talk, you say you write a lot in coffee shops. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're writing on a computer. Yes. Yes. And do you, and, and you're, you're basically being led by the characters. You're, you're discovering the story as you go. Yes. For better or worse. For better. (laughs) I think for, I think it's for good. And do you, um, do you write? Some people write very quickly, like will write the whole thing and then go back and and really not do any editing as they write. Other people like write and then the next morning edit what they wrote the day before. And some people edit as they go. Are you one of, are you, do you fit into any one of those categories? Yeah, I am an edit as I go sort of person um, because what I find is, especially early on in the book, every morning when I sit down to write, I basically start at page one and read it over and edit it until I get to, you know, the blank page and then I move on from there. So, um, so I'm, I'm constantly editing as I'm going along and I, I find that that's a helpful way to do it for me on days when I don't know where the story is going next. Um, Because, you know, there are those days too where you sit down and you get to the blank page and you just have no clue, you know. It's just, I don't know, I don't know. Um, (laughs) And those days can be pretty frustrating, but for me it's that's just an excuse to go and edit. Um, Because I always find that once I get back to that point, if if I've experienced the story again from the beginning, I can sense where it's going um, in a better, better way. Um, so, so that's helpful for me. Um, I was well, going to say something else about yeah. that, but I forget it. Well, that sounds like <laughs> really forgot. good. It sounds like really good advice. Um, you don't, yeah, don't I get, mean, it, 
don't get blocked if you can't write, just edit. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's part of the reason why I do it too, is just if I am blocked, I don't want to just sit there doing nothing. And do you write every day when you're writing a book? I do, yes. I mean, I try to take a day or two off, um, you know, maybe on the weekends, but it's, it, it was harder for me when I was writing Sorrow because I did have another full-time job. So I was getting up at, you know, by five o'clock every morning and spending three or four hours writing before I went to the office. So, um, so you know, when, when you have a limited time, you really have to kind of um, plan that out and schedule it in. When I was writing my the first two novels, um, I was a full-time writer. It was all I was doing. So I had the luxury of sitting there for eight hours a day and, and writing, and I couldn't do that with sorrow. Do you feel like you are just as productive in the shorter time with the limitations, or did you end up spending more, you know, more months writing the book because of it? You know, I actually think that it worked in my favor in this case because it really forced me to commit to a certain amount of time every day. And I think that served me well. Um, yeah, I think it, it was a good thing. You also made a trailer for this book. <laughs> and we see that occasionally. Not all books have trailers, but... Um, and for anyone who's who's not familiar, that's like a um, kind of an ad, a video um, of the book. So t tell me a little bit about how that came about and um, and what it's like to make a trailer for a book. Well, it's funny because I had never heard of them before. I didn't know they existed. And then the um, woman that has been doing the PR for um, for this book mentioned, oh, you know, you should make a trailer. And she sent me some examples, but most of the examples had actual real people in them, which, you know, actors, which I was uh, completely against because I just don't want to plant seeds in, in readers' minds of what these characters look like. I want them to, you know, use their imagination. So I came up with this idea. Um, there was a, an animator that I had worked with, um, in the record label, um, one of our bands made an animated video and this guy did such a great job that I called him up and I was like, would you be interested in doing a, a book trailer? And I, you know, sent him uh, a digital copy of the book and I just gave him some, a little bit of direction on what I kind of was hoping for. And then he just came up with it and I thought it was so sweet and so adorable. Um, and then another band I work with, who happens to have a song called Sorrow also um, let me use an acoustic version of that in the, in the trailer. So it just turned out really, really cute. Oh, very cool. Now, did you have any input on the cover of the book? I did have a lot of input on the cover and that was something that I didn't have quite as much input on with my first two novels. Um, but the publishers that I worked with on this one really cared about what the vision of the cover um, the vision I saw was. And um, so I had given them, you know, sort of a Pinterest board of thoughts and ideas and images. And then they came up with a couple examples and we picked uh, what became the cover as the, uh, as the one we liked best. And then we tweaked it a little bit, but um, I love it so much because I think that once you read the book, if you look at the cover, the whole story is kind of in there. Um, yeah. And, and I was really, it was really important to me that the cover have a masculine feel and also some sort of connection to nature because um, I think a lot of times with female writers, they tend to assume your audience is mostly female and that is probably true. Um, but I didn't want to exclude men from this book because I thought, um, <laughs> I thought they might get something out of it. And I've, interestingly enough, I've gotten quite a few um, emails and, and DMs on Instagram from men who have read the book and have really related to Joe in a lot of ways. And it's been really um, a beautiful thing to see and, and feel that, that men are kind of open to this story and relating to it on an emotional level. 
Well, what are the main things you want readers to come away from this book having learned or or felt? Um, yeah, I mean, I as far as what I would like a reader to feel, I always want readers to feel connected to the characters that I create because as I'm writing them, I become very connected to them and they become very important to me. And, um, you know, I don't know, I, I imagine it's a sort of like when you have a kid and you send your kid off to school and you want people to like it and, you know, think it's nice and smart and sweet and all those things. <laughs> um, so, you know, I want, I want to connect with people, you know, I, I want to connect my humanity to the humanity of the people that are reading this book. And, um, and I think I, I, I also hope that it makes people ask themselves questions about whether or not they've followed their heart and um, and done what they really wanted to do in life. And and if not, you know, can can they find the courage to make changes that are going to um, feel like something that nourishes their soul, which I think is is what we're all kind of here to do, but we don't always do it. Do you feel like you have followed your heart and done what you wanted with your life? Yes. Um, <laughs> pro sometimes I, sometimes maybe to my detriment, to be honest, <laughs> it's like my best and worst quality because, you know, it's also um, listening to your heart and doing what you want to do means disappointing others often um, in lieu of not disappointing yourself. So, um, you always run the risk of hurting other people when you do what you really want to do, but ultimately your responsibility is to yourself. So um, I think that's important. I mean, obviously that also <laughs> that... doesn't, that's not, that, there's caveats to that. Like, you know, if you make a human, you're in charge of that human and you've got to do a good job by it. So right, um, right. I'm not saying, you know, it, do whatever you want um, and disregard your responsibilities, but I'm saying find a way to fit things into your life that do um, fulfill you. You know, I have given this advice about, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at making decisions. And when people who have a problem with that ask me for, you know, how do you, how do you become good at making decisions? I, one thing I say is there are almost no decisions in life that are irreversible. Um, mm. The only ones are having a baby. <laughs> like you yep. said, making another human and um, anything associated with death. So um, other than that, if things don't work out, you can always change it. Yes. You can always yes. do something. And, well, and I think that the, the book is a lot about that in a way, and that's why it's called Sorrow, because if I've learned anything in my 49 years on this planet, it's that the times in my life where I've evolved and grown and changed for the better the most are times when I've suffered. Wow. You know, you've got a, we've packed a lot of wisdom here in the last five minutes. Of this <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so don't get me started. <laughs> One more well, cup of coffee and I could go for two more hours. Well, we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. But I want to thank you so much for, for joining us on Writer's Voices, Tiffany. Thank you so much for having me. It was really wonderful to talk to you. And we always close with a quote. Usually my mother and co-host uh, comes up with it. But this time I'm going to take it from the opening, um, the preface of Sorrow. Whoever uses the spirit that is in him creatively is an artist. To make living itself an art, that is the goal. And that was spoken by Henry Miller. Awesome. Love it. <laughs> so do I. And thank you so much. And see you all next week on Writer's Voices. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend.